Thank you, friends. Thank you. Um, well, since there's no way to live up to that introduction, I might as well just leave now. Um, well, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here with you all. Thank you, first of all, for those wonderful devotions, which are quite heartwarming, quickening, and a good way to kind of uh, introduce our subject uh, tonight. Um, Dr. Javahari, uh, last night, uh, covered the scope of the past hundred years of, of the development of the faith. And so um, what I'm going to try to do tonight is uh, do the sweep of the next hundred. <laughs> so, uh, of course, he has the advantage that we actually know what happened then. I'm <laughs> just making it up as I go along. But fortunately, there's a few pointers to, to help me along in this process. So, uh, okay, which way are you doing this? It's got to be right here. Okay. Sorry, uh, and then I have to back up. Um, I want to begin with a statement of Shoghi Effendi uh, in the uh, advent of divine justice. He said, and who knows, but then what he was talking about the unfoldment of the divine plan and the role that the American Baha'i community had to play as the uh, chief executors along with the co-executors of the national community in Canada and so on. And he, he talked about the, the, the uh, process by which uh, the uh, American Baha'i community had to step up um, in the face of uh, the, the Second World War, which paralyzed Europe, the op opposition in Iran that paralyzed that community. And so it was the chief remaining citadel to promulgate the plan. And he said there was an international mission that had to be accomplished. And then he said that, and who knows, but that when this colossal task has been accomplished, a greater, a still more superb mission, incomparable in its splendor, and foreordained for them by Baha'u'llah, may not be thrust upon them. The glories of such a mission are of such dazzling splendor the circumstances attending it so remote and the contemporary events with the culmination of which it is so closely knit in such a state of flux that it would be premature to attempt at the present time any accurate delineation of its features. Suffice it to say that out of the turmoil and tribulations of these latter years, Opportunities undreamt of will be born and circumstances unpredictable created that will enable, nay impel, the victorious prosecutors of Abdu Baha's plan to add to the part they will play in the unrolling of the new world order, fresh laurels to the crown of their servitude to the threshold of Baha'u'llah. So this still greater, more superb mission uh, has, is now the subject of, of our consideration. The House of Justice already began to allude to this process. If you recall the, um, the letter that was sent on the centenary of the anniversary of the t revelation of the tablets of the divine plan, there was one letter sent to the Baha'i world, one sent to the Baha'i communities in Canada and, and the United States. And already the House of Justice talked about that this greater mission of uh, the spiritual conquest of the planet, the spread of the faith all over the world uh, had been largely accomplished. And now these two communities stood side by side with their sister communities and so on. But the House of Justice said, but this mission is still not over and began to allude to this other still greater mission. And so, um, now the uh, uh, recent message uh, to uh, the um, November 28th letter also talked about that this time has now come. And so uh, the Guardian, this, this work that somehow mysteriously is tied in with the mission of the American Baha'i community and the destiny of the American nation 
that will lead to the changing circumstances, uh, which again in detail are not clear, but will open the door to the uh, 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 unrolling uh, and ushering in of Baha'u'llah's world order. And Shoghi Effendi reminded us in the advent of divine justice that um, this world order can never be reared unless and until the generality of the people to which they belong has been already purged from the diverse ills, whether social or political, that now severely afflict it, and which he went into some detail in the advent of divine justice to explain. So the aim of this talk will be to kind of introduce this, uh, the scope of this greater mission, but then also to kind of zero in, 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 to give a kind of a practical example, to explore uh, a framework for action for the elimination of one of these uh, evil tendencies from the fabric of society, the elimination of racial prejudice. So obviously uh, what I'm talking to you about uh, is looking forward into the future is a very complex question. All the details of it can't be known. There are many factors involved and so on. So I'll do the best I can to kind of present it it's also possible that you've thought about some of these things and you see some of these issues a little differently than I do. Well, that's fine. That's the beginning point of consultation and consideration. What I'm sharing with you tonight is not the uh, position of any institution. It's just my own insights and sharing it for the contribution to the consultation of the entire community as we begin to understand these things and work together within the framework for action. Now, um, I want to begin by uh, recalling the uh, letter that the House of Justice wrote in 2019, January 2019, about um, it was the anniversary of the peace process that ended the, the beginning of that process, that ended World War um, I. And at the time, if you recall, the House of Justice was diagnosing the current condition in the world, that humanity had tra trapped in a crisis of identity, and various peoples and groups are struggling to define themselves and, and their place in the world and how they should act. But often this took the form of various manifestations of us and them that pitted one group against another and so on. And so rival conceptions about the primacy of particular peoples are peddled to the exclusion of the truth that humanity is on a common journey in which all are protagonists, the House of Justice said. So we found ourselves in this ironic position that after 100 years, humanity went from being divided, fighting world wars, trying to put things back together again, then fighting a second world war, again trying to put things back together, then a cold war, and it looked like toward the end of the 20th century that we were on the precipice of a new world order. That was the discourse. And you remember the Millennial Summit and um, this movement, this great hope that the world was finally gonna put, get its act together and put the pieces in place to establish the lesser peace and, and unite its efforts. And immediately when we moved into the next century, things began to disintegrate again. And now we find ourselves almost back where we were uh, at the start of World War I with um, nations uh, fighting great power politics and so on, and the world dividing and fragmenting in these different ways. <coughs> so this um, breakdown in the world that we see is manifested in, in multifaceted ways. One is a breakdown in the understanding of where you find truth. So suddenly humanity uh, doesn't trust expert opinion anymore. Uh, People don't know how to disagree with one another without actually hating one another. Um, there's competing ideologies in politics, economics, about identity, about social theories, and so on. And people are losing faith in both science and in religion as well. So these knowledge systems, all the ways of finding truth and so on, people are losing their faith in all these methods. So we can't find... Um, uh, truth, we substitute ideology 
And then we impose, we, we go to war one ideology against the other and try and impose it on each other. Then uh, another aspect of this is a breakdown in justice where we don't know what the proper relationships are between one another. We don't know what we owe to one another, what's due, how we should organize ourselves so that these relationships become harmonious and so on. So the relationship with God, with ourselves, with our fa within families, uh, within communities and so on, uh, within uh, the larger society and between nations, all of these relationships are breaking down. And also, uh, there's a breakdown in the understanding of what actually constitutes a good and a meaningful life and what's the purpose of human being and so on. And finally, a breakdown in the shared idea of who we are and what story we're a part of. What is the story of the human race? It becomes fragmented into many different stories of competing ideologies and competing groups of people and factions and so on. Now, it's interesting if you look at this a little closer, you can see that kind of the, the, the heart of the matter is people living according to certain patterns which are explicitly called out by Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l Baha about how we ought not to live. So we're, the human race is more and more living exactly the way that Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l Baha said not to live. I don't think I could put it up here. So, for example, one of these things, you, you recall from Secret of Divine Civilization, where Abdu'l Baha talks about that close investigation will show that the primary cause of oppression and injustice, of unrighteousness, reg irregularity, and disorder is the lack of the people's lack of religious faith and the fact that they're uneducated. And because of that, people can't even articulate uh, what, what their problems are. And so they become objects upon which others act. And of course, people don't uneducate themselves. What happens is others create a condition that prevent them from gaining this education. And so then they become objects where others act upon them and so on. Another uh, condition that we see widespread, Abdu'l Baha warns us, he says, you belong to the world of purity and are not content to live the life of the animal, spending your days in eating, drinking, and sleeping. He said our thoughts are sh and our ambitions should be to acquire human perfections and to bring about happiness for others. That's why God gave us our intelligence, Abdu'l Baha explained. But then we look around us and we see, well, how many people are living that life of just basic existence, of material existence and so on. And not only that, but again, not only are people falling into that pattern, but others exploit those who fall into that pattern. So they commodify them, even on your social media, how many clicks and so on because somebody's making money off of all the time that you're spending scrolling and clicking and so on. So as long as people are content with eating, sleeping, acquiring, and so on, somebody can make money off of that. Then a third category we see too often in the world is people becoming fanatical. Again, detached from true knowledge of reality, they become attached to these different ideologies and so on. And so then they can become, their passions can be directed and misdirected in different ways. And then of course, if people fall into this category, again, there's also those people who exploit people and uh, actually uh, promote this fanaticism and use those people to acquire power and so on. So again, from the secret of divine civilization, Abdu'l Baha says, what an extraordinary situation now obtains when no one hearing a claim advance asks himself what the speaker's real motive might be and what selfish purpose he might not ha have he might not have hidden behind the mask of words so you find for example that an individual seeking to further his own petty and personal concerns will block the advancement of an entire people to turn his own water mill, he will let the farms and fields of all the others parch and wither. 
To maintain his own leadership, he will everlastingly direct the masses toward the prejudice and fanaticism which subvert the very base of civilization. So these are the pitfalls that humanity is falling into, falling into these patterns of life. How essentially Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha are wanting not to live. And yet we see that increasingly being the pattern of more and more people and also the people who are there to exploit those patterns. So one element then clearly for the Baha'i community is we have to make sure that these kinds of forces which are gaining momentum in a disintegrating old world order don't find a place in the Baha'i community themselves. So of course we're surrounded by these ideas. We're surrounded by these ideologies. People are spending billions of dollars a year to convince you to live one of these patterns of life and so on. And so uh, in politics and economics, social theories about human nature, purpose, identity, they're all taking these forms and so on. And it's very difficult not to be swept up by these forces. But then we have to remember who we're supposed to be and, and the mission that we have to accomplish. So it's not about what we see in the world, taking sides and fighting it out. It's not about hating the other people who don't think like you do and so on. But instead, we have to tie ourselves, our cord to the covenant, connect ourselves to the divine physician, uh, recognize that he doeth what he willeth, and then become the instruments for the dissemination of this divine remedy. Uh, the guardian warned us, he said that um, he wasn't prepared to state that the ways of God are the same as the ways of, of men. And he said that if we are to falter or hesitate, if our love for him should fail to direct us and keep us within his path, if we desert divine and emphatic principles, what hope can we any more cherish for healing the ills and sicknesses of the world? So it's only our ability to cling to these divine principles and to be the instrument for the diffusion of this divine remedy that is the, the hope for the accomplishment of our own mission and then the accomplishment of the destiny of the American nation as well. So in place of this how not to live, uh, Abdu Baha, Baha'u'llah tell us how we ought to live and how we ought to be. So, uh, for example, Baha'u'llah tells us that um, we are, this delivery of the divine remedy is our mission. He explained to us that these are not the days of prosperity and triumph. The whole world, the whole of mankind is in the grip of manifold ills. Therefore, strive to save its life through the wholesome medicine which the almighty hand of the unerring physician hath prepared. So again, we might have hoped to have been born in the golden age, then all these problems would have been taken care of and so on. But no, we're born in the formative age. This is not the time of triumph and prosperity. This is the time of crisis. And this is the time when we have to step up and deliver this remedy. So Baha'u'llah teaches us a new way of thinking and so on, how to have just the opposite of all these other things how to understand what the truth is, how our consciousness ought to be shaped. So he tells us the story of which we're a part, all the way back since the beginning of the human creation and the evolution, the social organizational evolution of the planet from clans to tribes to states to na nations and now uh, the, on the threshold of, the, of uh, a global civilization and so on. He tells us what our purpose is, this twofold moral purpose, which is to develop our own character and also to serve humanity. He tells us how to seek the truth about reality through the knowledge systems of science and religion uh, and, and to be able to engage in a process of consultation, which is radically different from the way the world communicates in the one sense that um, if you disagree with somebody, you can actually still like them. You know, you don't have to hate the guy who thinks differently. And then also to recognize that, well, the beginning part of consultation is precisely that we have different views, but then we continue to listen to what others have to say. 
And then if we hear a better idea, we grasp onto it. So the uh, search for truth begins with the clash of differing opinions, but then truth exists where opinions coincide. And then when we do reach consensus, then we test our ideas in action and we see if it proves to be effective. And if not, we come back and reflect some more. So Baha'u'llah teaches us the way that the world has seemed to uh, uh, have gone in the opposite direction of how we can come together in the search for truth. And then of course we live in this learning mode of continually seeking out the truth and testing it in reality and finding the solutions to human problems and then advancing to the next problem and so on. Another thing Baha'u'llah's teachings uh, explain to us is the nature of right relationships. Like again, if the disintegration of the world is based on the idea that human relationships are out of balance, people are contesting one another, people are imposing their power on top of one another and so on then the, the upliftment of the world is when all these relationships begin to become in the harmony with one another. So Baha'u'llah explains in his revelation all the nature of these re relationships and the nature of the balance. So again, beginning uh, with each individual then, uh, what is our relationship with God? What is the relationship with ourselves? Uh, when we go and pray every day, and, and reflect on our own life. We bring those relationships in the harmony and then we come out and then we work on the relationships in our family and then in the relationships in our community and then in our neighborhoods and clusters and so on. And then finally, you know, it begins the process of the right relationship with our nation and with the world and so on. So each individual then becomes the protagonist of making these proper relationships and gradually bringing balance and harmony back into the world. And finally, also Baha'u'llah gives us this idea of what the good life is, what the meaningful life is, so that we can look at all these various aspects of our life, our spiritual development, our education, uh, the, the, the service that we render to humanity, the systems that we're building in the world and so on, and see how all these come together in a coherent life of service. So this is the vision that Baha'u'llah gives us to remedy um, these destructive processes in the world. Now, of course, there's many elements to this mission, many aspects of the kind of transformation in society that has to take place if we're going to see uh, the uh, ushering in of the world order of Baha'u'llah. And uh, particularly then in America, the task that has to be done in order to create a spiritual revival in the American nation and move it from this disintegrative process to an integrative one so that also the American nation can fulfill its role in the rolling out of the lesser peace and so on. So this is not something we do exclusively, but we have to catalyze it through our own mission in the world. And it involves many things. Uh, but one of these things which I want to look at in the rest of my presentation today is then the concept of the eradication of one of these three evil tendencies that has to be done if we're going to be able to be successful in our mission. And so I want to look at the question of the elimination of racial prejudice by bringing it within the context of the framework for action that is gradually unfolding in the work of community building and social and economic development and involvement in the discourse of society. And even a few years back, I, I raised the same subject. How do we bring the intellectual life of the community, the work of the Association for Baha'i Studies within this concept of an evolving framework for action? Now, uh, a good encapsulation of this is from the 28 November uh, message on the first century of the formative age. The House of Justice has a paragraph there that talks about the nature of what is this evolving framework for action and so on. And um, it, it explained that the framework continually evolves through the accumulation of experience and the guidance of the House of Justice. Its pivotal elements are spiritual truths, cardinal principles of the revelation, uh, also, other elements uh, are uh, values, attitudes, concepts, methods, 
also the understanding of the physical and social world and so on. And within this continually evolving framework, Baha'is are learning how to systematically translate Baha'u'llah's teachings into action to reveal his high aims for the betterment of the world. The House of Justice went on to explain the significance of this increased capacity for learning and its implications for the advancement of humanity at the current stage of its social development cannot be overestimated. Think in terms of the scientific revolution. So for centuries, millennia, the human race existed at subsistence level. And then finally, there was a breakthrough in the human capacity to understand the material world and to translate those insights into technologies that could then begin to lift up and transform uh, human well-being. That went on for a portion of the human race benefited from that until finally in the late 1800s, more insights came and humanity was able to combine it in a way where science began to advance at an accelerated rate. Now think of what we're doing here in learning how to translate Baha'u'llah's teachings into reality and action in a systematic way. It's like a parallel religious revolution. For the first time in human history, human beings under, understand how to, uh, basically what Shoghi Effendi said, that the Baha'i faith is scientific in its method. The scientific method of translating spiritual truths into practical action for the transformation of human lives and human society. So this is at least as significant, if not more significant than the scientific revolution. And we see it as an empirical form of religion. It's not a bunch of uh, doctrines that people have to obey blindly and so on. It's an empirical result. By the fruits you will know them. If you put these teachings into practice, you see the transformation in action. And if you don't see that change, well, you haven't figured it out yet until you see the change and then you have the empirical results. So this is the profound change that uh, is now before us. And the examples we've seen, so you look, for example, back in 1996, and how much did we really understand with the first four-year plan about the nature of a systematic approach to advancing the process of entry by troops. We'd spent the previous 40 years, in a certain sense, going around in circles, trying to do the process of entry by troops. It began even during the lifetime of the Guardian, even during the 10-year crusade, but we couldn't master it. So we would enroll 10,000 people, or 100,000 people, or 2 million people, and then we couldn't consolidate them, and so on. So the, what would we do? We would go to the next country, and then we would try to do it there. And again, we, we couldn't work it out and so on. So that was why the House of Justice put us on a systematic track to learn about that in a systematic way, to figure out the elements that we didn't know how to do. And then we saw that the progress of each five-year plan then that, that went on. So for example, ideas like cluster, like um, uh, core activities, uh, junior youth program, and so on. These things didn't exist in 1996. Even the idea of study circle didn't exist in 1996. It took, the House of Justice said, offer courses at a distance. And then people tried to figure out, well, what does that mean? We know what bringing people to a course means. We don't know what courses at a distance mean. Until someplace tried it out, and they came up with the idea of study circles. And then by 1998, the idea of study circles could be disseminated and so on. So step by step, all these elements came into being. What's focus? What's an outward looking orientation? What are three core activities? And then initially book five was supposed to be the second year of children's classes in the scheme of the Institute and so on. But then uh, the junior youth program uh, came in and so that became the fourth core activity and so on. So bit by bit, everything had to be learned. Uh, the idea of a program of growth. Again, it's not really there so much in the four-year plan. Nobody was learning about it. The, the teaching center experimented with it in the one-year plan. Then when the first five-year plan began, the House of Justice couldn't articulate what was a program of growth. It said, these are prerequisites. These are some of the things to get you started. 
Now go out there and figure it out and so on. And the teaching center members went out and they met with the friends and they, they sat in clusters and they started to figure it out until a pattern emerged. And then that pattern proved to be effective and it could be replicated in other places. Okay, a three monthly cycle, uh, intensive teaching phase, a consolidation phase, then reflection and a new cycle begins and so on. So that by the time of the second five-year plan, then the Hasa justice could explain that pattern. And, so and then again, for those of you who remember the first five-year plan, it was all about A, B, C, D, and so on. And then, no, no, now second five-year plan, uh, no more A, B, C, D, it's, it's first and second milestone and so on. So then people realize, okay, I don't have any A's, I'm back to start and so on. But what that was, was the consolidation of the learning all over the world. And no place had all of those elements because they were not articulated before. But then everybody could begin working on them. Then the next five-year plan, a third milestone and so on. Finally, by the time of the beginning of the fourth five-year plan, all of the elements were there to create very advanced um, uh, clusters, third milestone clusters that could grow to encompass tens of thousands of people and whole villages where everybody was either Baha'i or participating in the Baha'i activities. Now that document that uh, led to the last five-year plan that came out in uh, December of 2015 encompass all that learning of 20 year period. Everything was there. So you wonder, well, okay, well, why didn't the House of Justice just give us that document in 1996 and save us all this trouble of 20 years of trying to figure out what to do and so on. But the idea is, well, clearly it doesn't work that way. It's not about some kind of magical looking into the future and understanding all of these things. The House of Justice, gives us the guidance that we need to begin to act. And then we work on it, and then we discover things that prove to be effective. And those things that prove to be effective are disseminated and so on. And then gradually a pattern develops that's captured in future plans and so on. So there's no way standing there in 1996, even with all the guidance that was given, and then you could imagine where you would be in 2021. It all had to be learned step by step. And so maybe we, we, we still couldn't imagine how entry by troops could be systematically pursued. And then uh, by the end of 20 years, 25 years, we, we had it figured out. The same thing you see in the junior youth program, how it developed within a framework for action. It actually began with OSED doing a series of literacy projects. And then when we brought people to Haifa, to talk with them and see what worked and so on. Well, there was a particular resonance with this junior youth age, 12 to 14 and so on. And they really responded to this. And so then the conception of a junior youth program was, was initiated at that point from a literacy project. But then, okay, so let's have a program. But, but what, what do you do? What materials do you have? None. What do you say to junior youth? We don't know. What do you say to animators? We don't know that either. Or parents, don't know that. So everything had to be figured out step by step by step until now we have a global system of uh, network offices and learning sites and a uh, series of 12 books. And we have clusters where they have a thousand or more junior youth in the program, hundreds of thousands of junior youth in the program worldwide, but starting from basically scratch and so on. And not imagining what it would be at the end, but then just learning step by step within this evolving framework for action. And then things became clear over time. So this framework for action has been implied in all of our areas of endeavor. And the question is, how can we apply it? If, if the goal is to eliminate racial prejudice from the fabric of American society, well, for starters, I wish that the House of Justice would give me that letter from 2044 that would explain how to do it, and then it would save us a lot of trouble and so on. But we don't have that letter, okay? It'll be there, don't worry. But right now, the question is, all right, what, what do we have to start? What can we add to this evolving framework for action so that instead of a whole bunch of diffused activities going on in the Baha'i world, we can begin to build unity of thought and action and, 
instead of kind of like wandering around with entry by troops for 40 years or wandering around with the efforts to do something for uh, race unity for 100 years, now we can put it on a systematic course where we make a beginning and we don't stop until the problem is eradicated from American society. But then that takes a process of learning. So we begin with this evolving framework. What's in that evolving framework? Well, everything from the concepts of growth that we have, the institute courses and so on, that's part of it. But then there's other elements that we need to examine. And again, at the beginning, our, our views, our actions might be very wide. That's fine because we, we have diversity of thought. We have diversity of experience, first of all. The way that racism works in the society is that some people can be completely oblivious to its action because it doesn't affect them. And other people feel the grind of it uh, on their neck every single day in one way or another. So that's a diverse experience. So of course we're gonna have different takes on what needs to be done and how we need to do it at the beginning. And that's fine. That's again, part of a process of learning is knowing where we used to be and where we are now and then where we're going. So, all right, if, if where we understand is wide right now, that's where we are. But then we have to add elements to our framework of action and begin to become more systematic in what we do so that over time, just like with uh, 96, everybody in the world started to do their own institutes. By 2021, we consolidated around this skeleton of the main sequence of courses of the Ruhi Institute because it's what proved to be effective in action and other things didn't prove to be effective. So we start now with a range of action, but where we wanna to get to is the place where that insight about what proves to be effective becomes clear. Not because our opinion is this and then we argue, but because we see it empirical results of the religious and scientific uh, ideas in action, and we see the, the actual result. That's what we're looking for. So there's other elements then we have to add then uh, to our framework. One is um, then a, a certain reading of the social reality. And again, this is a very complex thing. Um, 400 years of this system of racialized thinking in America that's created a certain kind of a hierarchy that um, Americans have created for a certain purpose. It's a process of othering. It's a process of hierarchy. Uh, one author described it as a caste system and so on. And that's what has been put in place over 400 years. So the reading and understanding about it is gonna be very diverse and how to undo it becomes a very challenging problem. Think, for example, just about the idea of, all right, racism as a term. What, what does that term mean? Well, if you look at the idea of various thinkers, once upon a time it was quite clear, it meant white supremacy. So white people think they're superior, that's racism and so on. But then, uh, as the House of Justice pointed out, uh, conceptions evolve. Like when you call out a certain thing, then it mutates into a different form where it's still trying to maintain this hierarchical system, but it uses different language, it mutates and so on. So then racism uh, became institutionalized racism. Nobody would admit they were racist, but then you still found it expressed in institutionalized system. So then one author talks about the idea of racism without racists, for example, because it's embedded in institutionalized systems. Then racism as microaggressions and so on. And then uh, ideas that black people can't be racist because they don't have power. Uh, the idea that white people will always be racist and cannot change. Then the idea that no, either white or black can be racist depending on who is uh, expressing racist idea that one race uh, um, is uh, inferior to another race and so on. Uh, so all these forms, even like this idea of microaggression then split, like some people said, well, microaggressions is like racial abuse. And then said, no, other people say, no, microaggressions are just kind of misunderstandings at a certain time. The University of California in 2015 said that the statement of there's only one race, the human race, was a microaggression. 
So this confusion, again, forget all the nefarious people who have reasons for promulgating the existing system. Just think about all the good people who want to get rid of that system, but they don't agree how to do it. They have different views. A lot of these different manifestations were expressed by uh, thoughtful people who were looking for a way to solve the problem and so on, but they didn't agree. And again, they fall into this kind of dichotomous thinking and so on. So one of the things we see kind of dominating the, the perspective is, first of all, people generally in, in this uh, idea of, of uh, fair-minded people and so on, recognize that, look, race as a biological reality or as a spiritual reality doesn't exist at all. It's only a social construction. But what do you do about this social construction? One uh, part of society keeps reconstructing it in a different form to maintain the racialized hierarchy and so on. But others who try to get rid of it then are stuck. Do you create a different form? Like some argue, one kind of side says, no, we should be uh, blind to race because it doesn't exist. So we should embed in law uh, a sense of uh, we don't, you can't make decisions based on race, a kind of a color blindness and so on. The other side is a kind of uh, falling into a kind of uh, a recognition that kind of race does exist, but there, there should be equality among the races and so on. And then we're kind of stuck in uh, this kind of dichotomy where if you close your eyes to racial differences, then racism perpetuates itself. You don't see the problem and so on. But if you try to recast race, you're actually inadvertently maintaining the existing uh, categories, the boxes of race that you can't tr transcend. So either way, uh, again, these fair-minded people are trying to figure their way out, black intellectuals, other fair-minded people and so on, but they get stuck in this kind of um, intractable dilemma of color blindness versus racial essentialism. And the uh, Public Affairs Office of the National Assembly in its uh, discourse on race has captured this idea, which again, many thinkers have identified just this dilemma. I'm not, I'm not inventing it myself, I'm just reporting what others have said and so on. And the Office of Public Affairs has uh, explained this. It says, there's a kind of catch-22 in the current dilemma surrounding the question of racial identity in the United States. As a society, we can't currently be one people who are colorblind and do not see race in a society where racism is a disruptive everyday force. But at the same time, if we crystallize race into fixed categories that we each inhabit, we inadvertently reinforce the contemporary racist system. So even the census creates these boxes and then they assign you to the particular box. No, you self-assign yourself because you have to check the box. And so we end up trapped in, in these categories and even it gets mutated. Like just recently, even this year, uh, the categories have changed. That um, the, there used to be one system of ethnicity, uh, Latin or not, and then five boxes. Uh, now, uh, no, uh, Hispanic Latin becomes one of the other boxes. And also, Middle Easterners used to be white, now they're their own category and so on. So there's this tinkering with the, the caste system, but it's maintained rigidly. And so, on. so how do you get out of it? What is the future toward what, what we're going toward? Um, is it just endless permutations of uh, disguising this hierarchy, but somehow maintaining it and reconfiguring it, there's clearly political forces at work trying to do that. Or do we imagine some kind of um, multicultural thing where every race is equal to one another and we have measures to make sure that, uh, you know, all the outcomes are equal or something like that? Or ultimately, is there a place where we can get to where uh, this racialized system, racialized thinking of America doesn't even exist anymore? See, there were 400 years of the racial caste system in America. Before that, 
the conception of race from America didn't exist. It was born in the Enlightenment, and then it took root in America. But some people say, look, first there's race, then there's racism, then there's slavery, like you justify through racism the right to enslave people. But recently, commentators have said, no, the process is exactly the opposite, that what you needed was cheap labor in the colonies, and you took it from Europe as indentured service, servants and from uh, Africa as, as slaves they, they came through the Caribbean and so on. But then what happened is you had problems and so on. So white people were tended to sympathize with other white people in that dilemma and so on. So then you started to change the categorization and so on. So the whole issue is first comes the economic oppression. Then you create racism as the excuse. Like if I other these folks, then I don't have to treat them the way I treat everybody else and so on. So racism comes next. And then race is created as the result of racism. So actually some thinkers have argued that, look, actually if you do the opposite, if you get rid of race, racism, race goes as well. So these are different kinds of conceptions that people had. Now, the question becomes, if we take that, and again, like I said, you might have different perspectives, you might have different readings and so on. It's a complex thing. I'm just reporting on some things people are talking about, not saying that's the only thing that you can think. But now come the insights from the revelation of Baha'u'llah that have to be added to our evolving framework for action as well. So of course, primarily, uh, there's the principle of the oneness of humanity. Baha'u'llah's fundamental principle. And Shoghi Effendi makes it clear, look, this is not a pious call for brotherhood. This is the organic restructuring of the civilization and so on that reflects the oneness of humanity. If we think we're all one family, we wouldn't structure the world the way we're structuring. And we certainly wouldn't create this racialized hierarchy if we thought we were all part of one family and so on. So Abdu Baha singles out this one verse of Baha'u'llah, you're all the leaves of one tree. And then he goes on to explain. He says, this means you're all the leaves of one tree. It doesn't mean there's two trees. One is divine and one is satanic. One is us and one is them. One has to be treated with justice the other one can be exploited and so on. He said, no, there's only one human family. And uh, Shoghi Effendi explains that this principle calls for the reconstruction and demilitarization of the whole civilized world. It represents the consummation of human evolution from family to tribe to kingdom to nation and now to one global civilization where this oneness that is true in spiritual and biological reality becomes oneness in the expression of social reality as well. But then this other principle is that um, this oneness of humanity is expressed as unity and diversity. So it's not that uh, we all become uniform. No, there's still this great diversity among the peoples of the world. It's just that after 400 years of thinking of a racialized hierarchy, it's very difficult to think of diversity as anything else. But diversity existed before this thing existed, and it'll exist after we get rid of it, and so on. There was one um, story that was told by um, Isabel Wilkerson, who wrote the book Cast. And um, she said that she gave a lecture in, um, in London. And at the end of the lecture, a uh, Nigerian uh, playwright came up to her and said, look, I really liked your lecture and so on. But she said, you know, there are no black people in Africa. And so Isabel Wilkerson was saying, what, what are you talking about? She was startled. And then the woman explained to her, she said, you know, uh, most Americans are weaned on the myth of drawable lines between human beings. Uh, and then uh, the lady explained to her, Africans are not black, she said. They're Igbo and Yoruba and Iwe and Akan and Nibele. They are not black. 
They're just themselves. They're humans on the land. That is who they see themselves as, and that is who they are. It's only when they come to the United States that then they have to fit into this hierarchical system and so on. And not just them, but, oh, somebody comes from, uh, I don't know, uh, Slovakia. Suddenly you find, no, you're white, and so on. So everybody kind of has to fit into those categories and those boxes until we break those boxes and then can, people can be people on the land, basically. Everybody can be that, and we can be one family. So this system, then, is the thing we're trying to uh, get rid of, and so on. So uh, this unity and diversity, the diversity that we'll create, is something that we can't imagine, something that kind of goes back to or even transcends the conceptions of the way human beings thought of themselves before. Now, if I can find my place again. Um, so another aspect of the teachings of Baha'u'llah is that justice is manifested by these proper relationships. So again, if we understand how Baha'u'llah is saying we should relate to God, we should relate to ourselves, we should relate to our family. If we build these right relationships, then the human race will begin to change and flourish. And these relationships depend on the expression of spiritual qualities. So again and again, the kind of qualities we need to reorder these relationships among ourselves are explained. We need spiritual love and heavenly harmony, perfect love, unity, and kindness, faith, assurance, extreme patience, true humility, consummate tact, sound initiative, mature wisdom, and deliberate, persistent, and prayerful effort. And the Guardian and the House of Justice points us to the example of Abdul Baha and, and, and says that we have to emulate the way he acted if we're going to see this change. Tactful and wise in his approach, penetrating in utterance, indiscriminating in fellowship, unfailing in sympathy for the downtrodden, courageous in conduct, persevering in action, imperturbable in the face of test, unwavering in his keen sense of justice. These are the qualities we need to emulate. Then the question becomes, whose job is it to clean up this mess? And again, in the wider society, well, it's black people's responsibility. No, it's white people's responsibility and so on. But the Baha'i writings make clear, it's both responsibility. Abdul Baha says, Strive earnestly and put forth your greatest endeavor toward the accomplishment of this fellowship and the cementing of this bond of brotherhood between you. Such an attainment is not possible without will and effort on the part of each. Each one should endeavor to develop and assist the other toward mutual advancement. And of course, the Hazrat Justice explained that the the situation's even more complex than it was in the 1930s because of the increase in racial diversity. Now everybody has a part to play in creating this um, brotherhood and this erasing this, uh, this racialized system from human thought. And our goal also is clear from the writings. Baha'u'llah wrote, close your eyes to racial differences and welcome all with the light of oneness. When he talked to E.G. Brown, he just said, we desire but the good of the world and the happiness of the nations. And he added that differences of race should be annulled. God, Abdu Baha said, makes no distinction between the white and the black. God did not make these divisions, he affirmed. These divisions have had their origin in man himself. Therefore, as they are against the plan and purpose of God, they are false and imaginary. Strive jointly, he added, to make extraordinary progress and mix together completely. I pray that you attain to such degree of good character and behavior that the names of black and white shall vanish, also be called human. So again, standing here, it's hard to imagine. How do you erase, how do you rid yourself of 400 years of thinking and action? But even everybody on the planet doesn't think like America has, has woven this, this 
particular racial cage for all of its inhabitants and so on. The whole world doesn't think this way, even though the West projects this conception into the world and so on. So we have to find a way to eliminate it. So for Baha'is, these questions that are debated in the wider society are clear. Our aim is the oneness of humanity. That's the ultimate anti-racist principle. It's not simply about fighting racism. It's about building a system where racism finds no place, the oneness of humanity. So are we affected by racism? Of course we are. We live in a racialized society. We're all affected by it. We're not all affected in the same way some more egregiously than others and so on. But we can't imagine that we, we live in a mud puddle, we, but somehow we escape from, from being dirty. No, and, and it's very clear from the writings that, that we haven't escaped from it. So we have to come to grips with our reality today. Who's responsible to do it? Every Baha'i working together. No one can claim to have adequately discharged the hopes of Abdu'l Baha according to Shoghi Effendi. Each has to uplift the other, Abdu'l Baha says. So is race real? No. God did not make these divisions. They're false and illusory. What is our aim? The complete elimination of racial prejudice from American society. That there's no name except humanity amongst us. There will be unity and diversity, but not in this racialized way. It's and even if we can't imagine what it will be, that's the aim that we're going toward and we'll find it when we get there. Now, how do we get there? Learning, for, and learning through action and reflection within this evolving framework. And Baha'is serving as 11 to transform the society around it. So it's not like, again, that we're sitting here and we make one diagnosis and we prescribe a cure and then it's like almost like a formula, just roll out this formula and you'll solve the problem. No, actually where we stand, we don't know how we get there. We're, we're in 1996 or in, we're in 2001. We're not in 2021 and so on. So we have to set in motion uh, a systematic process of learning and we begin where we begin. Whatever our diverse range of understanding, whatever our diverse range of action, but then gradually over time, we systematize thought and action. We get unity of thought and action. And we prove through experience what works, and then we disseminate that uh, thing that works more widely. So um, we don't have to get trapped in ideas of the past. We don't have to get trapped in these false dichotomies, even of, again, sincere people who don't know their way out. We have to find the way out and work with them to draw the insights from the best of thinkers, but then put in motion a process illumined by the revelation to begin to lead us out of this, this place where we're stuck now. So the way to do this is through the framework of the plan that's in action now. Um, when Shoghi Effendi wrote the advent of divine justice, he said, uh, which you all know, look, you're too small to have an effect on the wider society. So you should begin by working on yourself to prepare, prepare yourself for that day when you'll be called upon to eradicate these evil tendencies from the wider society. But then he said, all right, how to do that? He said, Turn to the spaces that you have. You, you don't have these spaces in the wider society, but you do have your own spaces. So he said, freedom from racial prejudice should be consistently demonstrated in every phase of our activity of the Baha'i community, <laughs> individually as well as in their official capacity as organized groups, committees, and assemblies. It should be deliberately cultivated whether in their homes, their business offices, their schools, their colleges, their social parties, their recreational grounds, their behind meetings, their conferences, their conventions, their summer schools, their assemblies. So all the spaces we had, we were supposed to make the oneness of humanity in those spaces. We were supposed to make interracial fellowship in those spaces. And uh, again, we did it to whatever degree we did it, to whatever degree we failed and so on, but here's where we are right now. 
Now the House of Justice says, all right, our ability to make spaces has been uh, vastly changed. And in, it's broad enough to, to reach outwardly, to encompass others in these spaces. So um, there's the spaces for community building, for social action, for involvement in the discourses of society, for building the intellectual life of the Baha'i community, and so on. Uh, and it said, the time to build it is now. So, all right, we used to be small, we used to be weak, we should have worked in our own spaces, we did it to a certain extent, now we have to take and work in all the spaces where we inhabit, and the spaces that we can create, and the spaces that we can make bigger and bigger. So, yes, a first milestone cluster, 10 people, but make that a reality in that space. Then a third milestone cluster, 1,000 people, or more, or tens of thousands, or 20,000, or learn to make that 50,000 or 100,000 in that space create the oneness of humanity. These spaces that we create are spaces of human flourishing. So it's spaces for education in all of its form. It's spaces where we learn to walk the straight path between extreme orthodoxy and irresponsible freedom and learn how to put the teachings into practice. So it's in these spaces that we have to learn how to create the oneness of humanity. These spaces are what they call liminal spaces. They're transitional spaces from one form to another. So you have the old world order and you have the new world order. Well, we're not in the new world order yet. These spaces that we create are somewhere in between. They don't play by the rules of the old world order. They're not yet the new world order. But in that space, we have to do the best we can to make the oneness of humanity the reality in that space and to put the Baha'u'llah's teachings in full in that space. So yesterday, Dr. Javahari told us a couple examples of those spaces and the impact of those spaces. So that one space in Zambia where um, that, uh, that traditional leader said, Baha'is are the only ones under his rule who appear to have a clear aim in life and are able to work towards achieving it. So he was going to throw his full effort behind it. And then that lawyer in Toronto who observed that the flow of its guidance of the House of Justice makes her feel that the betterment of the world is certain and it is going to happen. So that's the kind of space that we're trying to create. In, in Virginia, in one community in Virginia, where the friends had established the core activities, there was a report. They asked the, um, the mothers uh, about the impact of this program uh, and, and what they were witnessing and so on. So some talked about the transformation of their children, how they, their character had changed, they became serious about their studies and so on. And one woman uh, said that um, everything that she was going through was negative and hurtful. And she said every space she would go, there was only negativity and that this space that the Baha'is created was the only space where she could feel love and positivity. And that's the kind of spaces we're creating, a refuge for humanity in its time of difficulty. You remember that video of some years ago from India, where again, they have this traditional caste system that's not just 400 years old, thousand or more years old, and a very strict hierarchical system. But then as the Baha'is went, immediately they faced the pushback. But then as they talked with the people and the people understood the potential of the transforming process and so on, well, they wanted it for their children and so on. So the Baha'is said, look, we, we will train the youth to begin this process, but we can't train them separately. So you, you have to allow the youth to come together. And so the people allowed that to happen. And that kind of became the foot in the door where you began to work with all these young people. And as they proceeded through the courses, as they began to consider the teachings and the, the creative word that was in the courses and so on, well, without directly confronting it, this idea of caste melted away. And now you have these villages which, where this prevalence exists, everybody is in the core activities. Well, the, the, the manifestation of the caste system is completely gone in that village. Brahmin eat with the Dalit and so on. And, and 
this one cooks for the other and this one goes in the other's house, things that were unheard of uh, and now become the, the practice of the day because the Baha'is created a space which was not the old world order space. And again, not quite the new world order yet, but a place where the oneness of humanity can be expressed. And in one cluster after another, they're rolling that process out. So I'll give you just one other kind of personal illustration of, of this process, which is my own family. So I married my wife, Marsha, and uh, again, so we have an interracial marriage and so on. And immediately then, the space we create as a family becomes a different kind of space. Now, in that space, we don't see each other as race. We see each other as the person we love, you know, the husband, wife, and so on. And then that space becomes a learning process. We see with the eye of oneness, but the world is not one yet. So the world thrusts itself upon us. So one early experience I had driving in Wilmette uh, in my little aged a bit car and so on. And um, I don't know, most of you know Wilmette. Uh, uh, on, the, on the North Shore, white community and so on. So the police pulled, pulled me over one, one evening and so on when I'm driving in the car with Marsha. The policeman came up to me and then he looked at me and then he said some kind of like excuse, blah, blah, blah. And, and then he goes and turns away. And I thought, whoa. What happened? Oh, oh I did, at least I didn't get a ticket. You know, I, I didn't know what happened. So I had believed his excuse. So then Marsha had to explain to me that no, what happened is uh, you were pulled over driving while black, basically, or at least driving with a black person and so on. So what happened was a policeman saw her, thought, what is this car doing in Wilmette and so on, and pulled me over. And then immediately walked up and saw me and then made his exit. And of course, I was oblivious to what was happening, and, but she be, that began my education in a certain sense about certain realities that I didn't know that existed. So in this space, then we have children and so on. Now, immediately our kid goes to school. Which box are you going to tick for your child? Well, we refuse to check a box. Well, we'll check a box for you, okay. So I go to Northwestern, again, one day somebody comes up to me and says, oh, you're the guy who didn't check a box. And I said, yes, I didn't check a box. We're gonna check the box for you and so on. So the point is that we had to then kind of deal with these situations. And it was, again, mostly my educational experience uh, with the kind attention of my wife and so on. But, but again, then you dealt with the situations that came. And then when the kids got older, then there were different kinds of problems that, that came. But the family would always be one in our understanding of one another. Our, 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 the way we saw each other was one. But then these problems intruded on us. So again, I'm not saying interracial marriage is the solution of the problem. What I'm saying is this is an illustration of a space where you're forced to see each other as one. Like you can't see each other any other way. And yet you have to deal with the problems that come up in the wider society. So for example, now we have grandchildren and our grandchildren are um, white, black, and Samoan. So three check marks on the <laughs> census. And then our oldest daughter just recently was married and her husband is uh, Persian and Chinese. Four check boxes. If, <laughs> If they happen to have, God blesses them with a child, four check boxes. And so on. Then all we need is a strategic marriage <laughs> between one of those grandchildren and, and one, somebody else, and then we can get all seven boxes. But what do you call then that child who's white, black, Chinese, and uh, Persian? We call them grandchild. So this is the oneness of humanity, and then it has expressed itself in unity and diversity and so on. So friends, um, of course, that doesn't mean that in, when we create these spaces, that there aren't also some 
spaces where we're directly uh, attacking the problem of race. So a social and economic development project, an issue that arises, maybe an initial conversation that attracts people's attention and so on. It's not all indirect. It can also be these direct manifestations. But again, what we have to keep in mind is that it's not one or the other. It's not like we can solve the problem of race and then we can advance the divine plan. It's this thing that Chogi Effendi said about the inner and outer life of people. It's like the debate we had, like, you can't teach until, you know, you manifest all the Baha'i qualities. But you can't manifest all the Baha'i qualities until you teach. So the inner and outer life of humanity is, power, is, is parallel, and they're reciprocal on one another. So we have to act, and if we act indirectly, then we're building the oneness of humanity. That's... That's knocking down the racialized system. And then when the racialized system intrudes on our, on our space, our neighborhood, our cluster, and so on, then we take action to directly counter it, and so on. And these spaces are the haven that the House of Justice is calling for, in, most recently in the Rizvan message, but actually for the last 10 years. This is a place that has to be a haven to, um, as the old world order disintegrates, human beings will be pushed out of that order. And we have to be prepared to create the spaces, these transitional spaces, where they can come and experience the peace and love and harmony that comes from these spaces based on Baha'u'llah's teachings. Now, all this process, it's not just a matter of doing random activities in random spaces. Then we have to add the learning dimension to it, the ability to um, see where we're going and so on and then do a lot of different things, and then see what proves to be effective, and then gravitate towards those things that prove to be effective over time. That's the learning process. So it's not just everybody do what you want. At the beginning, it might be very diverse things because we don't know what to do. So do different kinds of things. But we can't impose our view, like I think a certain thing should be done, therefore everybody else should do what I think. No. I should go do it, and then I prove it's effective. If I prove it's effective, everybody's gonna come and visit me and come see what I'm doing. And so, so it allows at the beginning where we don't know what to do, diversity of action. And then when it proves to be effective over time, then our thoughts start to crystallize and so on. So we go from the uncertainty of the four-year plan to the certainty of the last five-year plan. And so we go from where we are now and again, however long it takes, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, if necessary, until we start figuring this out, and then we move to the next thing, and then we move to the next thing, until we can finally eradicate this problem from our society. For the individual friends, again, uh, we all have the power to step into the field of action. So, Shoghi Effendi says, if we're going to establish justice in the world, we might have to endure injustice. But what each Baha'i has to do is what's right. It's not about telling others what to do. It's you doing what's right yourself and so on. And then we don't have to wait for others to come along with us. We can find the space and do it. And if our Baha'i friends are doing something else, we can do it with people from the wider society and so on. But there's no criticism of others. Remember what Shoghi Effendi said, about Abdul Baha's contempt for and impatience with criticism. So critical thinking about how to do better, yes, but not criticism. We're supposed to have a sin covering eye toward others, but ourselves do what's right. And by doing what's right, we'll attract others to those things that are effective and that are right. And then those proven activities will be disseminated by the institutions and gradually we'll all move toward those effective aims. Now, friends, I, I want to conclude with a point. Only one concludes. <laughs> Sorry, Ferdinand. I only say that because Ferdinand was joking about it himself earlier. So. so I'm sure that after you hear all this, I can, uh, I can kind of hear all the Canadian friends breathing a sigh of relief. <laughs> But I want to remind you of a talk Abdu'l-Bahá gave in Montreal. 
where he said, I find these two great American nations highly capable and advanced in all that appertains to progress and civilization. Therefore, it is my hope that these revered nations may become prominent factors in the establishment of international peace and the oneness of the world of humanity. So no escape, my friends. You, you just have to figure how these different elements apply to you. And of course, the House of Justice said uh, that this same thing applies to every nation. But it might not be these three evil tendencies. But remember, we recently wrote to the Democratic Republic of Congo and this idea of ethnic conflict that was dividing their nation and how the Baha'is had to be a catalyst for removing that and so on. So our job is a spiritual revival. This greater mission centers around being a leaven that helps unite people in a common vision and a shared identity to overcome these evil tendencies and create a spiritually illumined, united, and flourishing people that can fulfill its destiny on the world stage and usher in the lesser peace. This path is by not doing something else, but by uh, pushing forward with the nine-year plan and advancing all of our clusters, 900 clusters in just the United States, and then add Canada on top of that, all these clusters to the furthest frontiers of learning and so on. And it might seem that the task kind of sounds unbelievable and maybe a little impossible, but actually there's a book by a political scientist who um, reflected on the period of 125 years from the end of the 1800s to the period where we are now. And there was a time called the Gilded Age in the United States where um, the same kind of conditions that we're seeing now were present then. Extremes of wealth and poverty, political discord, hatred towards immigrants, even add on top of that child labor and ex exploitation of young people and so on. But then that was followed. So there was an excess of materialism and widespread corruption but, and also people looking out for themselves and so on. But then this began to be followed by a progressive age where people looked at these ills and said, no, we have to come together in some way and figure out how to solve them and so on. So there became widespread social activism and political reform. Uh, the invention of high schools came at that time and communities paid out of their pocket before only that higher education could come for some privileged individuals. Communities made it possible for everybody to get that education. And this was the, this was the movement that was in place when Abdu'l Baha came to America. And you see, that's what he was impressed by. And he breathed the this, this spirit of life into those uh, practices and so on. And so what happened that by every social indicator, by um, political equality, comedy and politics, social cohesion, altruism and cultural values. It became a, a upliftment all the way from 1910 to 1960. All of these factors advanced as people pulled together to work on these problems together. Then something happens, it starts to disintegrate again and goes back down, almost making a perfect curve. So if that's what happened, like humanity made an attempt, Abdu'l Baha breathed the spirit into it, and it got so far, but then it broke down. So here we are, back down at the bottom, just like the story about, about the uh, international politics and so on. Now our job is to breathe life back into it again. But this time, that it doesn't come down. This time we make the transition into a new civilization, a new way of thinking, at least the lesser peace. We fulfill our mission, we create a spiritual revival on this continent, and these nations then play their part in contributing to international peace. And I want to end with uh, one of the same quotes uh, Dr. Javahari shared, but a little bit of some of the elements that he left out. Shoghi Effendi, writing in 1938, about the execution of the first stage of the divine plan, said much, however, will depend upon the spirit and manner which the task will be conducted. And this is the quote that the House of Justice used at the end of the first century. Through the clearness and steadiness of their vision, through the unvitiated vitality of their belief, 
through the incorruptibility of their character, through the adamantian force of their resolve, the matchless superiority of their aims and purpose, and the unsurpassed range of their accomplishments, they who labor for the glory of the most great name can best demonstrate to the visionless, faithless, and restless society to which they belong their power to proffer a haven of refuge to its member in the hour of their realized doom. Then and only then will this tender sapling embedded in the fertile soil of a divinely appointed administrative order and energized by the dynamic processes of its institutions will yield its richest and destined fruit. Thank you very much, friends.